today our subject, as you know, is sacred arts and liturgy, the importance of, of uh, visual liturgical art and how to commission it. Um, the reason I chose this, this rather specific subject of how to commission it is that all of you here <clears throat> probably will end up in some influential position in the church, either as a catechist or a priest or <clears throat> educator. Um, Jonathan and I in the back, I'm glad that Jonathan can join us, are both makers of liturgical art, and some of you, I think Jackie, you hope to paint icons. Um, but uh, it's no use making liturgical art if you're not being commissioned. So I'm going to concentrate on those who can commission church art. And here I'm not just talking about little icons. Architecture, the, the, the whole, what I call, the liturgical symphony, the sacred dance. Um, I think a well and <coughs> Can we have some water, please? <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> um, <coughs> I've been talking about the last few days. <laughs> I just need a bit of water. <clears throat> As we see that liturgical art is like a, a garden from which comes a spring. It's a sort of Eden, a paradise. So when we talk about the importance of good liturgical art, we're not just talking about something within the four walls of worship. From this beginning, this paradise, comes rivers which have a profound effect on our daily lives outside. Um, on the whole of culture, our daily lives, the lives of our family. So if we don't get the worship right and as rich as possible, then there's not a lot of hope, I'm afraid. Um, we'll go into a bit of detail um, later that if there are problems in a culture, look at their worship, look at what they worship, and you'll find that the problem begins there. So what I'm talking about is not um, just some nice aesthetic performance for the liturgy. This is where it all begins. This is where it begins. So it's really, really vital that um, people commissioning liturgical art, even if it's your parish is moving into a garage, you know, how you live out the liturgy in that garage is of vital importance. How you decorate it, you know, where you put icons, etc. The Garden of Eden planted by God, and it was planted by God, is actually the first church. It's the proto-church. So think of the world as God created it. It's a sort of fecund forest, just lots of life and oozing everywhere, but not much order. So God plants paradise. And the word paradise is a Persian word, which means a walled garden or park um, where the Persian emperor or king would enjoy time with his family and friends. So it wasn't just... Um, a place of contemplation. It's a place where you lived. Um, so God planted this paradise and he put Adam and Eve and put us in and said, now you fill and multiply and extend the boundaries, as it were, of that garden and make the whole world into a garden. So paradise is like God's church made without human hands. And as you see, this is an illuminated manuscript I did, and this hymn here is from an early British Orthodox saint, St. Kedmund, and it indicates something of what I'm talking about. Now the works of the Father of glory shall praise heaven's guardian, the creator's power and conception as he established every wonder. First he fashioned for children of men, heaven as a roof, a holy shaper, mankind's guardian, four men, the middle realm, the earth for men, eternal Lord, Master Almighty. I've sent the text of what I'm saying to Deacon Vitali and he can forward it to you. There's a lot in that, more than you can take in. But the idea that heaven is a roof, you know, the cosmos is actually our home, or more particularly our church. The, sacred of our talk, uh, the, the title of our talk, Sacred Arts and the Liturgy, is actually a bit of a misnomer. You can't say, I'm going to study the human body and lungs. You can't say, I'm going to study the human body and the human lungs. The one, in, the one with another. So we can't really talk about uh, the liturgy and sacred arts, because <laughs> sacred arts is, is part of the liturgy. And uh, I may... Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm a liturgical artist working with matter, someone like Peter is working with music. So I'm just going to keep with my own sphere of, of experience, which is liturgical art is in the material realm. In other words, architecture, iconography, frescoes, stone carving. I'll show you examples of those later. So liturgy without matter cannot exist. And I'm going to be talking a bit about St. Irenaeus, um, who lived in the um, second century, and he was countering Gnostic heresies. There are different Gnostic heresies, but the one he was countering was one that denied the importance of the material world. These Gnostics said that matter is a result of the fall. So there's a lot of um, wisdom in what St. Irenaeus says about uh, the human person being made in God's image as a physical being as well as a spiritual one. And if we can think of a liturgy as a human person with spirit, soul, and body, so that the physical aspect of the liturgy isn't just an op optional extra, it's a central part of the liturgy. This, by the way, is my own parish church. Um, it's a 13th century church, and there are actually frescoes around here. <clears throat> you can see some patterns here, but here there's a figure to fresco from 1380. The foundations are from 800, so it's a pre schism church. And I frescoed this. I built the icon screen, a lot of the wood there is actually um, 16th century wood that has been chucked out by the builders. So I, I uh, took the rot off and made a lot of that out of that. So, um, and you can see the lamps there, we made the brass lamps. So all this stuff, all this physical stuff, is an integral part of spiritual worship. Christ said, God is spirit and they worship him, must worship him in spirit and truth. But we worship in spirit through matter as well as directly um, through our hearts. So I want to look, uh, look first at liturgy and the nature of the human person given that liturgical worship and the gathering of people to worship God is like a single body. What is true of the individual human person is also true of the liturgy. So let's look first at the nature of the human person. This is a, a quote from Irenaeus. Would someone like to read this out for us? Would you like to read the quote? Soul and spirit. Soul and spirit can be constituents of man, but they certainly cannot be the whole man. The complete man is a mixture and union, consisting of a soul which takes to itself the spirit of the Father, to which is united the flesh, which was fashioned in the image of God. Men are spiritual, not by the abolition of the flesh. There would then be the spirit of man or the spirit of God, not a spiritual man. Thank you. So what Duoneus is telling us is that to be a complete person is to be a deified person. But a deified person isn't just the spirit mingling with God and the body's cast off like a garment, like I take this jacket off and throw it on the floor. It's not part of me, but the body is part of me. So he is saying that the, the full human person is a deified one, but they deify it as a union of body, soul, and spirit, to which is united the flesh, which is fashioned in the image of God. This is an astounding statement, isn't it? The flesh is flashed, fashioned in the image of God, as well as the spirit, but I'll go into this um, in a second. In another... Um, paragraph, in fact the one after this, talking about how and affirming that it's not just the spirit and the mind but the body which is fashioned in the image of God. He says, but when the spirit is mingled with soul and united with created matter, then through the outpouring of the spirit the complete man is produced. This is man in the image and likeness of God. A man with soul only lacking spirit, is psychic, psychikos, soulish. Such a man is carnal, unfinished, incomplete. He has in his created body the image of God. He has in his body the image of God, but he has not acquired the likeness to God through the spirit. Again, that our body is created in the image of God. You notice here this difference between image and likeness. So to put, put it down... Simply, Irenaeus was saying that everyone, even the world's greatest atheist, whether or not he or she likes it, is in God's image. 
Adam and Eve were in God's image, but they weren't in God's likeness by creation. They had to grow into his likeness by deification. But this movement from being only image to image and likeness is a movement that involves our relationship with the material world. As our ministry as prophet, priest and kings of creation. So our liturgical life and our use of matter or misuse of matter is actually an integral part of our journey into deification because we're created, going back to Kedmanson, um, this is called Middle Earth. Can anyone remember where Middle Earth came from? Where have you heard Middle Earth from in literature? Tolkien. Tolkien. He got that from Kedman. So we're in this middle realm. We're spirit and we're flesh, so we're the mediators between heaven and earth. So we ought not to think of material uh, aspect of our liturgy as just a nice aesthetic thing. It's nice to smell a bit of incense. It's actually an integral part and the beginning of our priestly ministry, uniting um, what's lower with what is higher. And it's through operating properly as prophets, priests, and kings that we are deified. We can't be deified, united to God, without matter. Earthly worship is an icon of heavenly worship. So this is the, um, an icon of the um, protecting veil, sometimes so-called. For those of you who don't know the story, um, Constantinople was under attack, so people fled into Hagia Sophia, and a fool for Christ, uh, here he is, had a vision of the Mother of God protecting a city, and she was holding a veil, a symbol of that. So here we have the heavenly um, saints, the angels and the saints worshipping, down here, we have the earthly liturgy, St. Romanus, the Melodist, um, and, and so on. So this is earthly liturgy, which is a reflection of heavenly. So in one sense, liturgy isn't created by man. It's actually uh, participation in heavenly worship. Worship on earth should be an icon of heavenly worship. But this timeless worship is expressed through cultures, through individuals. So there's always an incarnational aspect to worship. This is why um, people like Andrew Gold and Jonathan and myself are sort of trying to um, create liturgical art that is timeless but also draws on our local tradition. It's Pentecost, isn't it? You know, one, one truth declared in different languages. Uh, in the, um, the hymn of entry, we say, we who mystically image, mystically represent, in the Greek there is ikon, ikonis, uh, ikonizondes, we who iconize, if you like, the cherubim. We who are mystically icons of the cherubim. So, um, worship is incarnational. It's a participation between the timeless Holy Spirit and, and, and us created beings. So there's always, and when it's healthy, a variety and unity in Orthodox worship. I'm explaining all these things because if you're involved in the future with the design of a church or the decoration of a church, whatever form that takes, um, you really need to know A, what liturgy is, and B, what state of soul you're trying to create. So unless you have the, the big vision, you're going to make wrong decisions. You know, we, we, we're going to, um, I don't know, the might think, oh, liturgy, I like lots of lights, so let's get lots of lights in. But then, how's that going to affect your soul? You know, perhaps less light would be good. So unless you have in your soul a clear idea of, of what um, state of soul, uh, what heavenly worship is like, you'd just be floundering around and you make arbitrary choices. An example, to my mind, of, of a very good contemporary architect who um, has studied deeply um, the timeless elements but tries to enflesh them uh, in this case in America, um, is Andrew Gold. And he'll be with us this afternoon, is it, this evening? Um, so these are just two examples of, um, of, of designs he's made that are drawing on the local um, tradition there, South Carolina, in, in, in this case. Um, so, um, we've looked so far at um, worship is incarnational, <coughs> Um, it's, it's, involved, it's incarnate in a culture. Um, worship is material as well as spiritual. 
We're worshipping in spirit, but we're worshipping through matter, through the right use of matter. Thirdly, I want to say how worship is communal. As an individual person, I might be enriched by a wonderful liturgy. Um, and you and I are, are unique persons, and that's valid. But always, worship is communal. I love that um, chapter in Hebrews. Would someone like to read this out for me from Hebrews? You have come to the Mount, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Thank you. So, Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, is right at the end. You can't get to him without going through all these other people here. It, the Christian life isn't just me and my sweet Jesus, and uh, I'll put up with my brethren. Um, we're made in the image of the Holy Trinity, and the Holy Trinity, God the Holy Trinity, is a community, a communion. So we're only ultimately made in God's image as communal beings. Does anyone know what the word for person is in Greek and Latin, or the words? Hmm? Prosopon. Does anyone know what they mean? What do those words mean, more literally? Face. That's what they mean, face. I have a face to see you, to hear you, um, and I have lips to express. So, the human person is fulfilled in relationship. And this is one of the heresies of modernism, really, that mistaken individual which is a self-contained unit, a brick with person. So worship, true worship, is uh, a, a movement toward true likeness to God through community, through, community, through communal life. Um, communism went the other way, and it said that the individual isn't important um, and they're expendable in the, in the name of some sort of uniformity. Um, our secular West goes the other way, and it's individualistic. So Christianity is personalist and communal at the same time. So I worship is always communal. This is a photograph of worship in, in, uh, in Russia, I, I think. Um, so worship itself is a, is a communion of, of people worshipping together, but this is reflected in how the different elements of material, liturgical life should work together. You know, it's no use saying worship is communal if, if all the, the icons and the the icon screen and, and the music and the words, all doing their own thing. You know, it's not a whole lot of people just playing their own individual instrument and making cacophony. So, um, and Jonathan often talks about the fractal nature of truth. You've got a big truth, but if you take a bit out, then that contains the whole. Within that, that contains the whole. So the way an artist puts colour to colour, line to line, word to tune, um, the hymnography to the iconography, and this was the... One of the reasons for me writing this book, um, I wanted to show how the liturgical texts inform the visual iconography and likewise the other way around. It's a seamless whole. So I'll show you a few examples of, of work that I've made. Um, I work in a range of mediums and um, I'll just explain very briefly um, you know, how I've tried to combine uh, the different media into single hymns. So, I was for one in Mount Athos, I was a novice monk for 12 years and two years training at Aveyron. So I was asked to make this casing for the Porta Aetis of Icon. So Aveyron means Georgian. It was actually a Georgian foundation. Then later on it became more Greek, but even then, I, when I was there, there was an Australian, a German, a New Zealander. My strange accent is because I was raised in New Zealand, though born in England. So I tried to combine different elements, these columns here, um, actually inspired by Georgian, these Byzantine elements here. I snuck a little bit of um, uh, Celtic stuff in. So um, I, just within the design, I tried to combine different elements. Um, but the important thing was the icon. Um, I did uh, various designs to show the abbot. Some were quite simple to concentrate on the icon, but they were a bit too simple. So it wasn't a worthy throne for the icon. But if it was too florid, they, they had a really florid one before that was so florid, you looked at that rather than the icon. So always you're balancing. It's got to be worthy of something, but not distract. So there's a hierarchy. It's all part of this sort of communal nature um, of things. 
Um, this is an icon I've done uh, recently of St. Cuthbert. Um, I'm named after St. Aidan of Lindisfarne, and St. Cuthbert was, I think, the second or third abbot after Aidan of Lindisfarne. Um, so in this, I try to um, combine um, different elements. Um, historicity, uh, here you've got a silver portable altar, um, and this is the Bible here, the oldest bound, original bound Bible in Europe, certainly. These were found in St. Cuthbert's tomb um, uh, in 1899, I think. So these were actually his. He would go around preaching and, uh, and celebrating the liturgy, and there weren't many church buildings around. So he would take, um, it's an Antonensian, he would take this around and that would be the altar. Um, so I've combined um, sort of a historical truth, but also obviously it's slightly abstracted to indicate his, his spiritual nature. This cross was found in his, in his tomb, that was his cross. But here I've, I've drawn on um, elements of, of early, well, 12th century um, English iconography, Romanesque in, in particular. Um, so hopefully a Greek or Russian would feel this is an icon, but then an English person who wasn't Orthodox would feel, oh yes, you know, it's my tradition as well, but look at elements of this. So again, I'm trying to combine things together. These are some frescoes and a mosaic I did. Again, talking about how you've got to harmonise, this work here, it's for Catholic Church, um, the uh, commissioner said, we really want... Uh, now, this one is actually Lancaster University. It's a Catholic, it's a Catholic chaplaincy. Um, and it's a curved wall, as you see. Uh, we wanted the transfiguration. Um, but we didn't want the figures at the end standing up. So they'd feel sort of towering over people in the congregation. So we wanted the congregation to feel that they're part of that transfiguration. So I designed it with that architecture in mind. So by the time you got down here, they're almost your own level. Um, it was horizontal. As you know, most transfiguration icons are in a landscape, sorry, a portrait. Vertical orientation. So you naturally have heaven there and earth there. But I couldn't do that here. So I had to design something that fitted that landscape. I've seen too much church architecture, iconography, sort of just cutting bits off to fit it arbitrarily <laughs> into a shape. Everything's got to be in harmony, according to the frame, to the lighting even. This here is a mosaic for a Russian oligarch for his private chapel, a really small chapel, probably a third the side of this room. So he's seeing it really close up, probably that close. So I use really small tesserae, and they're about, I'm thinking millimetres, um, about an eighth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch square. Um, if I'd done them with the larger ones, if I'm doing a big a mosaic scene at a distance, I'd use larger tesserae. So even the size of the tesserae you can adjust according to the actual situation. This is commissioned by the Russian Archbishop of uh, England to give to the Patriarch. Um, and he wanted me to... Um, this is important, it's a brief, a good brief. I'm going to finish off with a brief. Um, his brief was to draw on the British tradition. So um, details of this are taken from an ivory um, Episcopal staff from about, I think about 10th century. Um, and Britain is made of the Welsh, Scottish and Anglo-Saxon and then the Irish tradition. So these here, which um, are these, uh, one is drawn from the Anglo-Saxon, one from the Celt, one so on and so on. Um, I do stone and wood carving. Uh, this is my parish church. Um, this fresco here, a lot of that is drawn from Romanesque paintings at Canterbury Cathedral. Um, uh, so Romanesque stained glass. Um, so I wanted to draw as much as possible on the British early um, Orthodox um, tradition rather than just you know, slap some Russian and Greek stuff there. Also the wooden icon screen, um, that's made with what's called a pegged uh, mortise and pin and a pegged system, common in 15th century England. And I use what's called scratch moulding, um, which is a bit imperfect when you want a moulding as a technical term for the sort of, uh, instead of having a straight corner, you often have some sort of shape profile. So I use exactly the same tool that an old English person would do, not for sentimental reasons, but it produces a perfect imperfection. Um, um, and I, th I think I mentioned that the wood this is made out of is not a lot of it's um, actually from the original old church. 
Um, this altar, which is going to see it here, um, draws an element from the local monastery. This church was founded by an 8th century uh, convent, um, the abbess of whom was St. Milberger. She was an Orthodox Anglo-Saxon saint. So visited this um, now ruined uh, monastery and uh, took elements, these columns here, and these were inspired by that. We have a lot of Greek Cypriots in our parish, so I, I drew on a, a more traditional um, Byzantine design uh, there. Uh, metal work. This is a recent icon screen I've made for an Anglican church, uh, sorry, an Orthodox church in uh, Cambridge that uses uh, an Anglican church which is still being used by the Anglican parishes and the Anglican parish were very happy for them to use it on condition that their icon screen was moved out of the way when they'd finished their liturgy because it was then afterwards going to be used. So I had to design one that looked permanent um, that related architecturally to what was there but could be removed. So I, I, I designed um, and made the icons that had a, a metal worker make the um, wrought iron work so it could be folded away. So this is folded away out of the way. And you can see this is the original iron work that was already there. So I, this was inspired by that. So it's something new, but people walking in would think it had been there always. Interestingly, once it was put up, the Anglican Church liked it so much, they asked it could be left up during the week because it's an open, it's right in the middle of Cambridge and a lot of people walk in. So uh, that's interesting. Uh, this is raw time, but also slightly painted. And I got that idea from a Victorian, uh, great Victorian iron worker. And he has a lot of works um, all over England. So he would subtly paint it to bring out some details. So I think... Um, but let's just say, if I, and I'm, I'm not talking primarily to you as people who make icons or liturgical art, but people who might be influential in, in guiding um, what is and who is commissioned. If the priest here had said, right, I want you to make a, a, a Byzantine Greek icon screen, no discussion. It would have been different. It wouldn't have been as good. So the briefing is really, really important. Uh, a priest might actually take on someone who just would be the other way around, take on someone who just want to make something exactly Byzantine and not fit. So the priest could say, look, I know you haven't done this before, but I want you to look at this architecture, study it, and make something that it bebs itself in, it's incarnational. So there, the priest is actually a better iconographer than the man who would have just done it in the default you know, Greek sense. So, in fact, the commissioner, and in Greek, does anyone know what the Greek word for someone who makes, who funds the church is? Anyone know what the word is? Ktitores. So when you see, often you might see a big mosaic, and it says the ktitores, it's a difficult word to say, um, of this mosaic, and it gives the name. It's not the man who made the mosaic, it's the person who commissioned it. He's the creator. He's the creator. So this is why you, know, you people and future priests, future catechists, future theologians, where, are where it all begins. If you don't get it right, then everything that follows will be wrong. So in this case, the priest um, was great. You know, he, he, I would have done it anyway, but um, he, uh, he said, I really want you to embed it in to this particular place, which, which was an inspiring thing to work with. So, um, liturgical art is uh, material, it's incarnational, it's communal. We're going to look now at the effect, um, the twofold effect of, uh, of liturgy. What I call the liturgy within and the liturgy without. What I mean by the liturgy within is um, the effect that it has on our personal spiritual lives to worship in a church or even if the service hasn't begun, just to sit in the church, if it's designed um, with the sacred in mind, it will have a profound effect on your inner life, the liturgy within. And then we'll talk about the effect of that outside worship. So particularly I'm interested in light. Um, this is, um, I was a hermit for seven years, and I converted a barn into a private chapel, and this is a photograph of one corner. Is it possible to dim the lights a little bit, or, or not? I know you want to write. Just turn them out and just see what happens. Just for a second. 
That gives you a better idea of what I'm getting at. We can turn that back on in a second. So I'm using these two examples um, that um, in monasteries often you have very low ambient light. Uh, can anyone guess why that might be? In a monastery you want low ambient light. You don't want a lot of light flooding in. Can anyone guess why? Distractions. And why would that be important? The prayer. Prayer? Yeah. Be a bit more specific. What sort of prayer? I can pray aloud if there's no light or lots of light. Be more specific. What sort of prayer? The Jesus prayer. Exactly. So, um, this is where ecstasy, you know, we, we know all about ecstasy. You go out of yourself. Ecstasy is the opposite. The kingdom of God is within you. And there you'll, I said Ephraim said, there you'll, I said Isaac rather, there you'll find God, you'll find angels, you'll find demons. So um, in a monastery often you have this low ambient light to help this inner journey into the inner prayer. Another effect of low ambient light is that when you walk into a church with low ambient light, they're just oil lamps, what do you see first when you walk into such a church? Just looking at that, what's the first thing you see? The eye. The eye. You see the faces. You see persons. I was a consultant to um, this cathedral in London, um, the, the Archbishop who commissioned that silver um, Episcopal scarf to give to the Patriarch. And um, he brought me in halfway through, a bit too late really, because he, didn't, he hadn't a clear idea of, of what effect he wanted um, the architects and the uh, lighting um, technician to have. And it's, all this has been funded by an oligarch, so there's tons of money sloshing around. Um, and the um, lighting engineer just put lighting everywhere. Now, it was great lighting. He was a lovely guy. I, I really liked him. But he wasn't briefed at all about you know, why the light is there, what effect it should have on the soul. So it's just lighting everywhere. It was great for lighting up the different architectural features, but it didn't help prayer. So the Archbishop said, well, what should we do with this? I said, just turn most of it off. <laughs> uh, and then just get your oil lamps. There's already a lot of light flooding in anyway from this church. Um, so lighting is actually iconographic. It's not just a functional thing. Probably light more than anything can create an atmosphere of prayer. Forgetting about icons or anything else. So that's just an example of... of um... So you get, you've got one, f one type of lighting, which is the instatic, instatic lighting, but also you get the ecstatic lighting, I guess, of fear. It's a good example. Um, thank you, thank you. Ah, yes, very appropriate. <laughs> um, so, uh, a, a contemporary description um, of uh, Agia Sophia is from... Um, let me get it here. Ah, here we are. Uh, the, the Byzantine historian Procopius, talking about Agia Sophia, says, It is singularly full of light and sunshine. You could declare that the place is not light, lighted or lit by the sun from without, but the rays are produced within itself. Such an abundance of light is poured into this church. And in fact, um, aided by computer technology, there have been some research on these windows here. Um, so in the computer, they can adjust what's called the reveals or the window sills. Like these window sills are flat here, but in Agia Sophia, those sills, which have got mosaic on them, are angled. They change the angle to see how it would affect the lighting on the dome. And the angle they've got is the only angle that works. If you change the angle, there's a lot of light around the outside, but none on the inside, etc., etc. They could do it by computer technology. Uh, and that's just the beginning of it. I mean, it's just astounding. And one of the architects, An Anthemius, was actually an expert known in his time for the study of angles of incidence. And I'll show you a drawing actually by him, which overlaps perfectly with all these angles here. It wasn't just by trial and error, he knew what he was doing. Um, so that's a different form. It's more ecstatic light. It's a, it's a not a power, it's a cathedral church. Obviously, you want to... Um, inspire prayer, um, but the different forms of prayer, you know, there's the inner monastic prayer and there's the outer communal prayer. So light can be used in different ways depending on um, what, your, what your aim is. Can anyone tell me the three classical stages in the spiritual life and their names? I'll give you a clue. The first one is purification or practical theology. 
Does anyone know the other two? What are they teaching you here? What are they teaching you here? Illumination. Illumination, good. And what's the Greek version of that, do you know? Pratiki, sorry, um, uh, physiki theologia, natural theology, yeah. And then the third? Purification. Purification is the first. Purification, illumination, and then? Perfection. Perfection, union with God, or mystiki theologia, exactly. Yeah. So we, we, we've seen um, already how um, low light can, can help this turning, this purification, this turning inwards, which can then ultimately lead to union with God. So you can see how the aesthetics, aesthetics can help the ascetic journey of the Christian life. So that's liturgy with that. I'll just give one example of lighting. Um, how it can um, aid our personal um, prayer. But let's look at liturgy um, without. In other words, how liturgy can affect life beyond. Going back to the very first image, there was a garden, but you notice there are four rivers coming out. Can anyone tell me the vision of Ezekiel, what he saw? He was taken to a temple by an angel, and what came from under the threshold? Does anyone know that story? Something came from under the threshold. A river. Does anyone know what the effect of that river was? Jonathan, you tell me. The river came out from the threshold. What happened? Did it just go into the ground and disappear? Or what happened to that? Exactly, yeah. So actually, interesting, it starts as a, as a trickle. Then um, Ezekiel is taken by the angel about a third of the mile on, and it's, it's ankle deep. He goes a third of the mile down, and it's knee deep. Read it. Um, when you go home, read it. Don't take my word for what I'm, what I'm saying is true. It goes for a long, it's way steep, and then eventually it's just a river and no man can pass. And it flows into the sea, probably the Dead Sea, and brings life. Wherever that river goes, it brings life and, and there's abundance. So let's, this, this, is, this is the temple. Spiritual life flows from that. But, but even within the temple, you've got the church. That's a Catholicon in the middle. And I've lived in this monastery, Veron, and every aspect of life comes out of the liturgy. Has you, have any of you read the Hymn of Entry by like mind of Basilius? Yeah, well, do read it. It's all about that, really. This is, this is where the beginning is. This is sacred, and that's not profane. The sacred starts here, then overflows to make everything sacred. So once a year, um, I think it's the Thursday of Bright Week, we process the Porta Aetisa icon, um, it, it came by tradition by sea on that day. We persist and go all around here and stop at various places. So it starts in the altar, but then you, everything becomes a place of prayer then. So this idea of the liturgy within extends and sanctifies everything around. This is just a Greek town. You can see this is a procession. You know, the streets become a church. You can see this in traditional... Russian and, and, and Greek and so on, um, villages. You know, there's a distinction, I suppose, between church and the rest, but really, um, your whole life outside becomes an extension of, of the church. One of the roles of liturgical life and the um, icon, iconography in general is to help us to see the world as a flaming bush. I was giving a talk at Princeton University a day or two ago and I spoke a lot about how when Moses saw the bush burning without being consumed, it wasn't that God decided that bush is going to start burning just for the sake of Moses, but that bush had always been burning with God's glory. It says in Hebrews that he upholds all things by the word of his power. So when I look at a stone outside of those trees, I don't just see a stone in a tree. I see a little label hanging on it, from God with love. This ring I've got, it's just a bit of gold. I could mount it down and probably sell it for about 20 pounds. That's one way of seeing this hunk of gold on my finger. What's another way of seeing that? Ring on my finger. What else might it say to me? What's an alternative way of seeing it? Who gave it to me? Oh. Symbol of your marriage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I can see that in two ways. There's a dead bit of metal or a sacrament, an expression of love. So when Moses sees the bush burning, his eyes are open to see it as it always was. It's burning without being consumed, so obviously the fire is not an ordinary fire. Um, so likewise, when Christ is transfigured, 
That's not really a miracle. I think the miracle is that he wasn't smiling the whole time. <laughs> he just revealed to them what he always had been, his divinity. If he had been walking around smiling like that, we wouldn't really have had much free will. You know, we'd just be obliged to follow him. But he hides his divinity and is more quiet about revealing it, just to give us freedom, free will. And a lot of the liturgical texts say, for example, when you are transfigured, O oh Lord, you show them the true nature of man arrayed in the divine image, in the divine glory. So he was showing us what it is to be truly man. So he's returning us to how things were intended to be. Um, this is a close-up of a tree in uh, a Polinardian class. Have any of you been to this wonderful church just outside of Ravenna? Yeah, well, don't die before you go there. You've got to go there before you die. <laughs> And when you see it, you're halfway in heaven anyway. So uh, even if you don't get to heaven, you've, you've, you've touched the hem of heaven's garment. You probably know it's a big, enormous apse. And you've got St. Apollinari, the bishop, praying there. And he's in this paradisical garden. And you've got the transfigured cross above. It's actually the transfiguration. It's not evident um, in the beginning. Um, and it's interesting that you've got this amazing description of, of, of uh, the liturgy, really, um, as the transfiguration. And then down below, you've got some windows down below. There are um, mosaics of bishops there celebrating the liturgy. You look further down, and there is the altar, and if it's a liturgy, you've got a priest celebrating. So this heavenly liturgy is expressed through time and the liturgy throughout time with the bishops, and then you're back down to today. But look at this. What do you notice about the colour change around the tree? Is it all the same green? Same? Yeah, I mean, there's a slight, almost like a halo around it, isn't there? You've got green and then it's sort of like a... So when you're exposed to iconography over a period of time, you don't have to know it consciously, you realise actually to see a tree not just as an object, but as a revelation of God's love. I was, um, I think I'll show you a photograph of you in a minute. I was commissioned by Philip Sherard's uh, wife to fresco a church uh, in their private land in Evia in Greece. Um, uh, to indicate something of the spiritual truths that Philip wrote about, which is um, ecology from an Orthodox Christian perspective. So we had standing saints, particularly those who taught a lot about the importance of the material world and the spiritual life, but in between was a tree. Um, and I had different trees, so I'd take a branch of a tree outside as a sort of a model and then paint that olive tree, let's say. I tried to do it in a sort of transfigured way. So I was there about eight hours. It was fresco on wet plaster. So you've really got to work intensively. You've only got about six or eight hours before the plaster is set. So I was spending eight hours painting a tree or the saint next to the tree. And then I noticed when I went outside and I finished the work, when I saw the olive tree that I'd been painting as a burning bush, I saw that tree differently. I saw it as a flame with the divine glory. So as well as assisting... Um, communal prayer and, and, and light coming from above. But also it helps us to live sacramentally, to see trees, um, uh, everything, people particularly, of course, as burning bushes. And this is repentance, metanoia. Some people say metanoia in Greek, repentance, means change of mind, but I think it's more profound to understand it as a change of seeing. Metanous, the noose is the eye of the heart. If you change the way people see, it changes the way they act. If I came in here and just thought of your students, you know, I'll, I'll treat you in a certain way, but I see you as living icons of God. You know, to me, you're awesome. You're really awesome. I mean, does each of you are potential saints? You're all saints to some extent. And I, I knew Saint Paisius, I knew Father, now Saint Sophroni, and met once Saint Porphyrius. All very different people, but you go, you, I went away changed and transformed. It's because of the way they treated me. They, 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 they didn't just see me as just well, another guy visiting. But, you know, I was, so I was the only person present at that time in the universe of the saint. Uh, he was talking deep to deep, from the depths of his heart to that part of me, which was the deepest and most in God's image. So the third thing I want to talk about is mission. So far I've talked about liturgy as um, worship, but of course it has an effect 
doesn't it? Um, we all know the story of the, the conversion of, of Kiev, of, of, of old Russ, through beauty. So I want to look at that a little bit before finishing off with some practical um, things. Mission under liturgical beauty. This is my church here. Um, during COVID, our church membership increased about 30%. So I was interested to ask some of the members, what was the first encounter you had? Why did you come to Orthodoxy? And one of them said it was coming to the, an, an evening service at this church. We don't have electricity here. And it was winter, I think, so it was really dark outside. And before we understood anything about orthodoxy, it was just taken by the atmosphere, this low light and the, the frescoes and the icons, and that's what converted him. Um, then he started to ask questions, obviously, and, and read. Another person who became orthodox during uh, COVID, he, he heard a ch some chant, I don't know if it was by Dan, or Greek, it doesn't matter, and he thought, wow, that's from a different place. Where did that come from? It's as though he's walking along and he smells an amazing fragrance. God, where does that come from? And he, and he keeps asking people, well, where does that fragrance come from? And eventually someone leads him to the plant. Um, so that music in that case was the fragrance. I think one of the great things about divine beauty is that it can bypass caricatures of God. If a lot of people say to me, I don't believe in God, I say, okay, that's fine. What, what God don't you believe in? What's, what's the God like that you don't believe in? And I'll describe this God. And say, well, I'm an atheist as well. I don't believe in that God either. So um, divine beauty can bypass a lot of these misconceptions because it's the language of the soul, isn't it? Um, you need to follow it up with the word because divine beauty is just not a gooey feeling that comes and goes. It, it should bring us into relationship. Here's an example of um, what beauty can do. Um, uh, and you're a really saintly Catholic um, priest, and um, wherever he went, um, parishes would just f flourish, you know, sort of bursting at the seams. So he had a parish already in Leeds in the UK, but he heard that there was another big church that was going to be closed down by the diocese. I think the diocese was broke, and there weren't a lot of people going to this church here, um, so they wanted to sell it and get money and pay off their debt. But he pleaded with the bishop, Father Michael, his name was, to give him a year to see what he could do with the parish. And rather reluctantly, the bishop said, oh, OK, hoping he would fail because he needed the money. Um, the first thing Father Michael did was to commission me to paint this fresco here. You can see how big it is. I mean, if you stood up, you're that big. Within a year, that was packed, that church. And I, I bottomed this because of the fresco. But interestingly, he spoke a lot about deification of union, which is why he wanted the subject. So two things, instead of sort of trying to give sermons and be nice and, 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 and follow trends, he said, no, you're created for union with God. And he preached that and it struck a chord with people. But at the same time, they were drawn by the beauty. I spoke to a lady about a month after this was done and she said, oh, before we were just praying toward a white wall, with this little cross on it. But now I'm praying to the living transfigured Lord, it completely transformed their worship. And then other people came in who weren't Christian, so it became a missionary thing as well. So time's going on. I'll just very quickly finish now um, with um, some practical principles for, um, that, that you personally could consider if you're involved at all in a committee or as a priest or whatever, um, if you have any influence in the future. If you, even if it's the dis what sort of icon screen to have or anything, what sort of lighting to have, these principles will apply. This is just what I'm saying here. It's the, the, the teacher is the maker. This is the commissioner here who, who commissioned the church. So here's some principles. Um, number one, before you do anything, have a clear idea of the spiritual effect you want the new works to achieve. So start with the outcome. What's the final outcome? What effect do you want it to have on your parish? and on people's souls. So um, this is the parish church, a different sort of outcome is required there. This is my, um, my hermitage where I pray the Jesus prayer and do, and, and do the liturgy. A, a different outcome, not obviously not contradictory, but a slightly different emphasis. So I chose a different approach. This has got a whiter background. This has got a blue-black background. That's more in static. That's more, let's say, ecstatic. So the first thing, you know, don't jump into it until you know really why you're doing this, what, what you want the outcome to be. And then secondly, have a clear written statement of those desired outcomes. It sounds horribly sort of business speak, but it's just common sense, isn't it? Then thirdly, 
choose carefully whom you employ to design and execute the work. Uh, this cathedral in London, um, they thought, right, we've got lots of money, this is a cathedral, let's employ really good architects. But they didn't think, actually, there might be great architects for museums or palaces, but are they the right person for this job? You know, you're not going to get anything better from a person um, accord, other than their, their vision. If their vision is not informed by liturgy, you're not going to get a good liturgical work. You might get a great secular masterpiece, but it's not going to be good for liturgy. So do your research. Um, ensure new works harmonise with your particular church. And you might get a really good iconographer, say, and he's got a default style. You can say, OK, I, I know you've done it like this in the past, but you know, hold on, just, just, I want you to look at our church, look at the lighting. This is our parish. You know, we've got Georgians, we've got Armenians, we've got Americans, we've got... You know, just, just have a look and, and design something that will look as though it's always been there. Now, I'm six foot two and I need to buy clothes that fit me. I'd look ridiculous, wouldn't I, if I bought a jacket, you know, for someone who's five foot two. You'd think, what is he doing? But we do that all the time with Orthodox churches, I'm afraid. We do. We think, oh, this is a Greek church, let's bring in a Greek iconostasis or whatever. It doesn't fit you know, in this American church. Be authentic. Ensure that the new works incarnate timeless principles within your particular space. Remember that horizontal transfiguration I did? Very different from the vertical one, but hopefully they both work. And your parish? You know, have in mind your parish. You might have two parishes with identical churches. And you'll do it differently, depending on the ethos of the parish. And your culture. You're in America. You're not in England. You're not in Timbuktu. You're not in Russia. Draw on all that's good on your culture. So you know, be authentic. Don't pretend to be something you're not. And if you want a theological basis for that, look at the early apologists. You know, they had to look at the, um, theology, the, the philosophy that was around and select. Now, some of that philosophy had to be rejected, but others they took into the church. So physical, visual, liturgical art, and also fragrances, and we'll be talking about all five senses, needs to um, draw on all that's good. Do not necessarily go for the cheapest option or for the most expensive. Choose what is best for your particular space within your budget. Um, you can have an icon, like for the Russian um, cathedral, for example, the architects had designed really, really florid um, icon cases. There are about 10 pillars, and each pillar they wanted a case on for icons. And the one they designed, A, was just unsuitable aesthetically, but also they cost about £25,000 each. So I designed one that was simpler, but hopefully more elegant, and they cost £6,000 each. So more expensive, and a more expensive architect or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean the better. So um, don't let a limited budget become an excuse for shoddy work. Sometimes I've been asked to do icon screens for really poor parishes. So carving takes time, so I didn't do carving, but I did, I remember there's one, I had some second-hand wood, so I painted it a deep bluey green, I think, and then just did a simple but elegant scroll design on it, and it was gilded, so there's a bit of glory there. But it only took about three days to do. So a limited budget doesn't necessarily mean you've got to have something that's cheap and, and rubbish. Uh, limitations can actually be a good thing. Really good. Um, involve the congregation in the process. I don't like design by, um, or decision making by um, committee, but the Holy Spirit is in everyone in your parish, so involve them one way or the other. And one way of doing that is... Um, I think one, one, one role of a priest is to discern the gifts of the Holy Spirit within their parish. I just don't like top-down stuff. They've got to discern the gifts and draw them out. He's more like a conductor rather than someone running around playing the violin and running over here and playing the cello. You know, he just stays there and he makes sure that everyone's gift is being used. Um, that's a contribu contribution towards the long-term beautification of all the churches, not just your parish. Consider supporting the proper training of a liturgical artist in your parish or diocese. So this is thinking of the long term. Uh, for icon painting, if I have an apprentice, if that's full-time training, it might take six years. You know, it's, a, it's a big task. We know this with music as well, you know, to train as an opera singer. But we, but, uh, Jonathan, I got a lift from a friend, Raymond, who's an opera singer, and he said, 
to become a good opera singer. He didn't give it years, but I'd imagine it's like 10 years or something to be good. Um, so you, you, can, you, can, you can help fund someone to come and train somewhere. Um, encourage seminaries to include a mandatory course on the importance of material liturgical art. I, I'm just dismayed how Orthodox seminaries, as well as Catholic and Anglican ones, don't have it as an obligatory module. It, it's got to be. It's got to be. You know, it's just, there's no question about it. We talk about how, how wonderful Orthodox beauty is, people convert. But if we don't have a module just on the basics of liturgical art, what I've been saying today, you know, why we have it, what are the pious principles, we're going to make mistakes again and again and again. And just by having seminarians, theologians, catechists, just probably only takes about three days in the whole three-year training just to get the general principles. Even, even if it's to say, ah, oh, actually, liturgical art is important. Let's not rush into it. Even if that was communicated, that would be enough. Think of all the fruits of that into the future. So, um, so talk to your president. Make this course mandatory. Um, <laughs> and, and other such. Right? And not there's any theory, philosophy or science uh, or history that's got nothing to do with your... You know, start with the end, which is to have people understand the principles of good liturgical art. You know, start with the outcome and then work backwards from there. Thank you.